Good afternoon. My name is Robin John. I'm a director from Weld and Turnbull. This afternoon, I want to talk to you about the Chancellor's autumn statement earlier today. Not only what he said, but what we know is coming anyway. Business rates will make a difference in Elmbridge because in future, the council will be able to keep 100% of the business rates that it raises. At present, Elmbridge only keeps a very small percentage, less than 10%. In addition, the rates relief for small businesses will continue. Buy to Let has received more attention from the Chancellor, together with Second Homes. In future, there will be a 3% surcharge on stamp duty land tax on buy to let purchases and second home purchases. Details are to follow later. In addition, capital gains tax will have to be paid within 30 days of the sale of the property, whereas at the moment it can be paid nearly two years after the property has been sold. Tax avoidance is something that chancellors pay a lot of attention to and it's received a lot of attention in the media. There is a figure called the tax gap, which is HMRC's estimate of the difference between the tax that it should collect and the tax that it does collect. They estimate this is about £34 billion, uh, about 6.4% of total tax revenue, although obviously there's an awful lot of guesswork and estimating involved in that number. Although it sounds like a lot of money, it is low by international standards compared to countries such as, for example, the US or Sweden, who both have a relatively tax-compliant population. In addition, despite the focus it gets, only an estimated £2.8 billion is actually as a result of tax avoidance, whereas, in contrast, about £1.1 billion relates to cigarette smuggling. Nevertheless, the Chancellor is proposing some more provisions on this. In future, there will be a 60% surcharge on any scheme that falls foul of the GAR, that's the General Anti-Avoidance Rule. Serial tax avoiders, that is those who have repeatedly engaged in off-the-shelf tax schemes uh, which have failed, which of course many of these off-the-shelf schemes do, will be named and shamed. There will also be a consultation on company distributions. Um, I don't know what that means at the moment, although it's possible that the Chancellor will be looking at the tax treatment of distributions on liquidations. He also proposes to look again at disguised remuneration rules, primarily, I would imagine, Employee Benefit Trust, EBTs. There's already been a lot of legislation about this, and many of you will have seen in the press recently, HMRC were successful in their recent case against Rangers Football Club. That wasn't that good a victory for the revenue, because although it held that the payments were subject to tax, what happened was that the company had to account for PAY on the payments, and that particular company is in liquidation and hasn't got any money. It's possible the Chancellor will be looking at provisions to make the tax follow the payment so that the person who actually received the money would be responsible for the tax if the company was not able to pay it. We shall have to wait and see. We were expecting the Chancellor to say something about his review of the pension tax regime, but he has now delayed this until spring. Pension tax relief costs the government about £34 billion a year and the government receives tax on pensions that are paid of about £13 billion a year. The present pension tax regime is that payers get tax relief for their contributions, the income rolls up tax-free in the fund and tax is paid when pensions are withdrawn from the pension fund. The alternative arrangement, which is used in a number of countries elsewhere, is that there is no tax relief for the contributions, the income rolls up tax-free in the fund, and there is no tax when the pensions are paid out. It's a sort of super ISA type of arrangement. 
There are, of course, problems switching from one scheme to the other. It's relatively simple for defined contribution schemes, more difficult for salary, final salary schemes, because you don't know what's actually being contributed necessarily. And of course, what do you do for the public sector when there isn't actually a pension fund? In any analysis, you'd need two systems, um, one for pension contributions that have been deductible on the way in and where he'd want to tax pensions on the way out, and the other for new arrangements where contributions weren't deductible and where um, pension payments wouldn't be subject to tax. It would only be pensions paid from new funds that would be tax-free. But if you think about it, and you think back to the numbers on the first slide, there are some opportunities here because if the Chancellor switches the way that pension regime works, he's still collecting tax on the pensions paid from the old pension schemes, but he's not giving tax relief for contributions to the new scheme. So his tax take goes up quite considerably. In addition, he may be tempted to offer a conversion option to people whereby in exchange for a lump sum they would convert from the old regime to the new regime which would give him a useful boost to his public finances and to reducing the national debt. Other proposals which we've been told about but which we haven't yet got full details for, in future capital gains tax will be charged to non-residents non disposing of UK residential property. At the moment, there's no capital gains tax on non-resident individuals. That will apply with effect from April 2016. There will be inheritance tax charged on residential property owned by non-UK companies. At the moment, those properties aren't within the inheritance tax regime. And any person who is resident in the UK for at least 15 years will be deemed to be domiciled in the UK. That's all I have to say. Thank you.